Tanner, Tech Tanner, Tech Tanner, Tanner, Tech Tanner, Tech Tanner. Hello, this is Tanner Tech. What is a breadboard? Basically, a breadboard is a piece of plastic with around 400 holes drilled in it, with different groups of these holes being connected by pieces of metal inside. A breadboard is so useful for electronics hobbyists because you can merely plug an electronics component inside and connect it to other components with wires that also plug into the holes in the breadboard. Next thing you know, you have a whole circuit. Now, as many of us know, when you build a circuit, it usually doesn't work on your first try. But luckily with a breadboard, you can reconnect your circuit. You can reconnect different wires and different connections and switch out components until your circuit works. So as you can see, these are very useful for prototyping an electronic circuit. So let's get started in learning how these work. Now it's interesting to note the origin of the word breadboard for one of these devices. Now when the hobby of electronics was first on the rise, electronics hobbyists would take a literal breadboard used for cutting bread and they'd hammer nails into it and they'd use these nails as solder points to connect different components on their circuit and eventually build a fully functioning circuit on a bread cutting board. Now I've kind of experimented with this. I made this VFD amplifier on this piece of wood. So not exactly a breadboard, but same principle. When you're first building a circuit on a breadboard, there's something very important that you need to consider. And that is that the holes on a breadboard are either connected in columns or rows. When it comes to the power rail, all the holes in this power rail are connected to each other. That is the holes that fall under the plus sign, all electrically connected. And all the holes that fall under this negative sign are all electrically connected as well. But the holes in each column are not connected in any way to the holes in the adjoining column. And these columns are not connected in any way to these columns on the left side of the breadboard. Now the holes on the middle of the breadboard are connected in a different way. They're connected in rows. We have something going through the middle of the breadboard called the trench. And the trench electrically isolates any holes from this side from any holes on this side. Now the holes over here are connected in a row. So this hole is connected to this hole, which is connected to this hole, which is connected to this hole and this hole all electrically connected, but it's electrically isolated from these holes down here. And so each of these rows is electrically connected, but it's not connected in any way to the row on the opposite side. This is kind of a confusing concept, and I find it easier to explain by taking apart the breadboard. Now with the back of the breadboard removed, we can see the different pieces of metal that connect to the holes above. So let's pop one of these out and see what it looks like. There it is. So now I've done the unthinkable and broken my breadboard by pulling out some of these metal connections. And I stuck them to the sticky back of the breadboard. Just to illustrate how this works. So you see that when I stick this microchip on here, which by the way is something called a 555 timer, this leg of the chip or metal piece is connected to this entire row of metal connections or holes when you have it on the real breadboard. You can see that it basically turns it into a wire. And so if I hook up the leg of this resistor to this row of connections, you can see that it's actually connected to this point on the chip. I've also assembled the same circuit on just a piece of breadboard that hasn't been ripped apart. You can see kind of how that works. Looking at this side, you can see the hole down the middle. So this leg is connected to this entire row of metal pieces, while this leg is connected to this other row of metal pieces. Let's practice using a breadboard by building a very simple circuit that uses two switches, two resistors, and one of these LEDs that actually has two LEDs built inside it. So here is the circuit that we'll be creating. You can see here that we have the power supply voltage of five volts, which goes through two buttons the circuit diagram symbol for a button kind of looks like a hat sitting above a break in the wire. And I'll be going through two resistors, each of them 190 ohms. And these resistors resist the current that's going into the LED so it doesn't burn out. And those go into the LED. And it's important to remember in an LED that this line means the cathode of the LED, or the negative side. 
and that goes to the negative end of our circuit. So we'll start by adding the LED. It's important to remember that this positive rail we're going to identify as the positive voltage for our circuit, as well as this negative rail being identified as the negative voltage for the circuit. That way we can remember where all of our power supplies are. That way when we connect this to our power supply, in my case it's a bench power supply, but in your case it can be a battery, we'll know where to connect it. So now we'll take these resistors, we're going to connect this resistor to one side of the LED. You can see that because I'm connecting it here, it's connected underneath to this pin of the LED. I'm also going to connect this resistor to the other side of the LED in the same way. Now we see that this middle part of the LED goes to ground. And so we'll take one of these helpful wires and plug it in the middle. You can see that even though it's a little bit away from the LED, it's connected through this row to it. Then we'll connect that to the negative power rail. And now it's time for the buttons. So these buttons are kind of interesting in the way they work. When you press the button, this point connects to this point of the button, which makes it useful because when we connect it to the breadboard like this, When we press this button, this rail will become connected to this rail. And so we'll input both of these buttons into the breadboard. Now that we have these buttons in place, we can connect them to the LED. So instead of using a wire, I can just physically move this resistor and put it in this hole that corresponds to this pin of the button. I can do the same with this. Now finally, all that's left is to connect both of the buttons to the positive power supply. And I'll do that by plugging this handy wire in over here, and plugging this handy yellow wire in over here. Normally when I connect a circuit to power, I will just plug in a wire to one of the rails, and plug another wire to another rail, and then Hook these up to the alligator clips of my power supply. Well there we go, it works as expected. When I press this button, the light turns green. When I press this button, the light turns red. Now once you fine tune your circuit on a breadboard, then you can make that circuit permanent by soldering it to something called perf board, into a more permanent prototype. Once your more permanent prototype is finished and you want to make this on a bigger scale, you can then go on to creating an actual printed circuit board that can be replicated easily. So you can see that this breadboard is the start to an entire prototyping process of creating a brand new circuit. Well, I hope you learned something today. It's now time to go out there and experiment and build a circuit. And hopefully it'll work. I'll put some links in the description to some beginner electronics kits or places where you can buy different types of breadboards. But for now, stay tuned for my next video where I'll be showing you how to build a Schlieren light setup that allows you to see air currents using a telescope mirror. Until next time, have a good day.